static, we're going to get started. Right, just so that you're clear, you've got, um, you've, I think many of you came to last time's um, webinar. There are two teachers here. I'm here, Mr. Timmins is also here, and he's got the Q&A box. So if you type something into the Q&A box, he sees that and will answer it. And if it's really important, he will stop me and ask me to go over something again because people have missed it. So let's explain what we're going to go through. I'm going to recap waves. The reason I'm going to recap waves is that I got asked to after the last webinar because some people who are doing the foundation tier felt that I went a little bit too quickly. And then I'm going to talk about the electromagnetic spectrum. I'm going to take no more than half an hour. And these are the slides that are going to be used by your teachers to set your week's work now. So I'm going to explain how to do all of that as well. So the first thing we're going to start off with is just the two different types of wave. So last time I talked about the fact there are two types of wave you have to know for your exams. And the first one is this one, which is called a transverse wave. And this is one where the particles involved or the, the center of the wave moves up and down like that oscillation a vibration. So if you look at where I'm that dot there, if we imagine this was a wave on the sea and that that was a seagull and the seagull bobs up and down like that, it doesn't run along towards the shore, it bobs up and down, but the wave is moving along. So we say that the oscillations, the vibrations, are at right angles to the transfer of energy, which is going here from left to right. So this sort of wave would be a wave like the waves in the sea, or in fact, a Mexican wave <laughs> going around a football stadium is also uh, like this, but this is also um, light waves. So electromagnetic waves. And there are some names here that you need to know. You need to know that's a peak and that that's a trough. Okay, so that's transverse. And the bit that's important to remember, the oscillations, that means vibration, is at right angles to the energy transfer. Because that's what waves do. They transfer energy from one place to another. This one's a little bit harder to draw. Um, it's very unusual for you to be asked to draw one of these, but you'd need to recognize one. And it's called a longitudinal wave. And I kind of remember that because it goes along. There's no up and down, it just goes along. So here, the vibrations, the oscillations are backwards and forwards, and the wave is still moving from left to right. The best and only example you need to know about this one is this is a sound wave. This is what the air particles are doing. They're going backwards and forwards, and the sound moves from someone's mouth to someone's ear when making the air particles bump into each other. It's got some funny names involved, I'm afraid. These ones are easy. When the particles are close together, they're called compressions. They're called compressions. The hard part is where they move apart. It's called a rare faction because here, look, the particles are rare. They're pulled apart from each other. So where they're pulled apart, they're rare, rare faction. And when they're compressed, they are um, together. So that's nice and easy. So those are our two types of waves, transverse and longitudinal. Okay. Now, <clears throat> here's a bit that's quite important. So here's a transverse wave and we need to know the names. You need to be able to label a wave like this in your exam. You need to be able to say that the amplitude there, that's the height from the midpoint to the top. It's not all the way down from here to the top. It's from the middle to the top or from the middle to the bottom. Okay, so it's the size of the wave, but from the middle, that's the amplitude. If we increase the amplitude of a sound wave, we increase the, sound, the volume, hence amplifier. And that's where the word comes from. Wavelength, that is the distance between two points on the wave that are the same. So here we've got the two peaks, or we could have two troughs, or we could have two points where it crosses the line but that's the wavelength and we normally measure it in meters frequency is how many waves up and down cycles we get per second so here there are seven waves in one second so this frequency is seven hertz we measure it in hertz exactly like the car rental company hertz except we give it the the symbol hz so that's the basic of waves that I went over last time. You need to know transverse oscillations up and down, longitudinal oscillations along, 
for longitudinal. And we need to be able to label these parts of the wave. If you've got that, you've got the basics of waves. Okay. If you're not sure about this, go back over these slides, perhaps make some flashcards about waves to remember transverse, longitudinal, and being able to label a transverse wave. Very important. Now, the next really important thing, this equation. Now, if you're doing the foundation paper, you'll usually get given the equation. You will usually get given the equation. It's helpful to learn it because it's not a difficult one to learn. Wave speed is frequency times wavelength. So it's, it's not an awful equation. They'll usually give it to you. And I do say usually. Now, we're going to practice using it. We have to, oh no, this isn't the one we're going to practice. Let me just move on. So if you've got a pen and a paper, you might want to write, write that down. Wave speed equals frequency times wavelength. Now, I'm going to say it again when we move on, but let's just have a little look at um, some questions. So here's the example we're going to have a look at. So let me just move myself out of the way. So water waves can be making vi by vibrating a wooden bar up and down in a tray of water. So what someone has got here is a big tray of water, sort of washing up bowl size, and they've got a bar of wood, so a, a plank of wood, and they are bobbing it up and down in the water to make waves. So here we go. The bar moves up and down at a frequency of five hertz. So they move it up and down five times a second. They're going quite quick, okay? Now, what they would want to do here is write down the equation you would use and then show clearly how you work out your answer to calculate the speed in centimeters per second of the water waves. Now, I'm not gonna ask you to do this one. I'm gonna talk about how I would do it and then we're gonna have a look at one that you can do. So the first thing I do here is I look at whether they've asked me for the speed in meters per second or centimeters a second. They've asked in centimeters and my wavelength is in centimeters. So I'm fine, I can leave it like that. So I would need to do 48 times five. So I would write down wave speed equals frequency times wavelength. Then I would write down five times 48. Then I would write my answer in here for my third mark. So let's have a look at what that would look like for you. Hang on. Oh, I'm not quite sure where my, let me just see where my, um, where my question for you is. No, it's disappeared. Right, let's go back here. I have a feeling that the one that I want has actually vanished from here. Let's have a little look. So if I go up to polls, mm, Okay, no, whoops. Okay, so let's get rid of that. I'm not going to make you do one of those now because the question that I wanted to use isn't there right now. So let's move on. So that's an example of how you would do that. And here is an example of a question that would ask you to be able to describe the difference and explain the difference between a transverse and a longitudinal wave. So it says you may include label diagrams in your answer. It's absolutely fine to draw the waves and use those to help you explain. So you've got two questions here, one that asks you to use the equation and one that asks you to remember the difference between the waves. And those are for you to try later on. Because now, and there's some more examples there for you to work out. And again, the equation is given for you. So now I want to move on to something that is new. Okay, this is the electromagnetic spectrum. Now, this is something that I think is really nice for, for people that are doing the foundation paper and you're aiming to get 4, 4, 5, 4, 5, 5, or even a different grade to that. This is something that's really good to revise because this is something where it's just straightforward remembering some things and it works really well for making flashcards. I'm going to show you what I mean. So, the electromagnetic spectrum is made up of things that are all electromagnetic waves and they have some things that are the same about all of them. They are all transverse waves. So remember, those are the ones with the up and down on them. All of them are transverse waves. Nice and easy to remember. They all 
don't need particles. They can all travel through a vacuum. So these ones go through space. So for example, light that's coming from the sun is an electromagnetic wave. That's why it can get here from space. And they all travel at the speed of light, which is 300 million meters per second. But you just need to know they travel at the speed of light, all of them, because light is one of them. So what is in the electromagnetic spectrum? Well, here it is. Now, you are getting these slides, so you don't need to start writing it down. But let's have a look at what this picture is showing you. OK, so here's the bit of the electromagnetic spectrum that we can see visible, visible light in the middle. And there it is. There's the rainbow, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. OK, so we've got the spectrum in the middle of visible light. And there it is in the center of the electromagnetic spectrum. If we go to the left, we have got and the waves start to get bigger. Look, this is the wavelength in meters. OK, so that is still very small. Infrared is to the next. Now we know infrared, it's what allows us to have um, heat detecting thermal imaging cameras. It's also what is in your remote control for your television and your um, TV box and, and stuff like that. So we, we all know infrared really well. We move along the next one to microwave. Now, microwaves is quite a big section and there are lots of things in microwaves. We use them to cook, obviously, in a microwave oven, but also low energy microwaves are what mobile phones use to be able to communicate. And then if you look here, this is getting big. Okay, so this is this gives you an idea of the size. So visible light down here, we've got pinpoint size waves. Infrared waves, we're down to the size of maybe a B. Microwaves, actually, getting towards the size of people but radio waves are huge the size of buildings these are great big waves at this end and then at the other side ultraviolet well we know that one because uv light is the light that um, we use to detect counterfeit notes but it's also the light that um, gives us a suntan that comes from um, the sun and else also can be dangerous and now moving down this side, these are all the ones that can be really quite dangerous for us. They are called ionizing, and I'll come back to that. We know what x-rays are for in the middle. They get tiny, tiny. So look, we're down to molecule size, atom size, and then gamma rays. These are mostly used in medicine, unless you watch The Incredible Hulk, in which case they're supposedly what turned him into The Incredible Hulk. And we've got atomic nuclei. So something that's really useful to do is to remember the order of these, to put these out and to remember them in order and also to know that we've got biggest in terms of wavelength here and smallest over here. We can also talk about frequency, but for now let's focus on learning the order of the waves and that the biggest is at this end, radio waves, and the smallest is at this end, gamma waves. Okay, so before we move on, let's just see how many people were paying close attention there. And I'm going to set you a quick multiple choice question to see how people are getting on. So I've just described the waves to you, and that should have come up on your screen now, is which one has the biggest wavelength. Let's see what people think. So at the moment, I've got about a quarter of you have voted. I'm going to leave it up there for a minute. A third of you have voted now. You don't have to. No one's going to see these answers, though. I'm just going to see the percentage of you that got it. It lets me see how that's going for everyone. So about half of you have voted now and we're doing pretty well. We're on about 90 percent the correct answer. I'm just going to give you another 15 seconds or so. If anyone else wants to press it now, do it now. OK, so about 90 percent of you got that right, that it was radio waves. Well done. OK, so that's fantastic. So this is the answer. Radio waves. Look at that. There's the title. So I'm going to go through these really quickly because reading these to you will just get a little bit boring. Now, some of them are a bit wordy. What you need to know are some of the key features about each of the waves. So wait, these waves are really big. OK, they're one meter. So we've got up there 100,000 meters long. Their frequency, we're going to leave that out for the moment. We're going to come back to that. And we use it for TV and radio and telecommunications. They're not dangerous. You can't, there are no real dangers of radio waves. Okay. Microwaves. So 
they are the next biggest size of waves. So they are from 0 0.001 meters. So we've got things that are a millimeter in size up to a meter. So they're actually quite big, these microwaves. Um, and we use those again for telecommunications. So mobile phones, radar works using microwaves and we use them to cook. They can produce burns if they're at high energy. Okay, and there is a question there about whether they have ever been implicated in causing cancer, but there's not um, an awful lot of evidence at the moment. This thing, cataracts. Now, some of you might have heard of cataracts. Cataracts are when your the lens of your eye goes uh, cloudy, and um, you get a hard layer, and it can be difficult to see. Um, and certainly, a horrible story is when microwave ovens first came out. Um, sometimes they were a little bit leaky and people who put their faces right up to them to, to watch what was happening um, sometimes found that after a while their eyesight was really quite badly damaged because you're uh, constantly exposing yourself to microwave radiation. So infrared, infrared got the size up there. Heating, so those bar fires that glow red um, and you get infrared induction um, cooking plates, um, so also for cooking food, TV remotes, and night vision. Okay, just some things that you might want to remember there about how they get used. Visible light, everybody knows this one, so I've got the colours of the spectrum up there in order. Um, we use them from seeing, and I suppose we could say that light can be da dangerous because actually, if you stare straight into a really bright light, um, it can damage your eyes. So that's why we don't stare at the sun. Okay, so that's what we use it for. So let's talk about radio waves a little bit more and about how this works for um, TV stations. So radio waves are used for both radio and TV. So TV, terrestrial TV, that is becoming less and less common now where you only get the five channels bbc one two um channel four uh, bbc three and, and channel five uh, and you have to tune it in becoming very very uh, uncommon and it's going to get turned off soon so anyone that's still using that it'll get switched off soon and we're only going to have um tv that comes through cable or satellite what's important though is because the waves are so big that as the waves go across the top of a hill, they, they curve a little bit, they bend around the obstacle. And we can see that here, as they come across the top, they bend over. And even though this house is behind this hill, the radio waves bend over the top and we can still hear or get a radio, radio reception down there, okay? Short wavelength radio waves are too small because they're not as big, so actually, that house, if it was still using terrestrial television, would have a difficulty getting it. There is a problem with radio waves being that big. Any of you that have driven to Shoreham or Worthing and gone through Shoreham Tunnel on the A27 will notice that as you hit the tunnel, if you're on the phone, you can still make your phone call. Your phone signal doesn't disappear. That's because microwaves are quite small and they fit inside the tunnel. Because radio waves are so big, they don't fit inside the tunnel. And the moment you drive in, your radio signal disappears until you drive back out the other side. That allows us to understand the size of these waves because it fits really neatly into what we want. Now, we also are able to use uh, microwaves to communicate by satellite. Some radio signals pass through the atmosphere, but quite a lot of them get reflected. So if we were trying to do it over the top, that wouldn't work. Microwaves, however, do pass through the atmosphere. And so that's why we use microwaves to communicate with satellites much, much better. Now, let's just talk about, um, let's just talk about this. So we use TVs, satellite TV to use microwaves, which means you can watch them from, from the other side of the world. But because it's going so far, there is a time delay. So a solution, those of you that have got um, Virgin Television, for example, they use fiber optic cables and they are very fine plastic tubes and light or infrared can be sent down these uh, fibers. So um, infrared is used when commu computers are, are communicating with each other because it is really, really, 
really quick, okay? Because it's traveling at the speed of light. Um, so what's good about it, so we've got cable TV, we've got your broadband internet, and you've also got links between com computers. The signal doesn't get interfered with at all. So if we've got signals going up into space and back down again, there's lots of other things that can interfere with that signal. And we call that degradation. The signal isn't as good. They can go anywhere the fibers can go. So if you can get a fiber there, you can take a signal there and the signal travels faster because there's nothing to get in its way. Problem is they're really difficult to, um, to repair because they're deep underground if there's a problem. So let's just have a look at how that went for everybody. Let me just pop up another poll for you there. Um, so let's have a look at why fiber optic cables are better than um, microwaves, whoops, and satellites and microwaves. There you go. So if we were going to watch television, why would we want um, fiber optic instead of uh, satellite and microwaves? Interesting. Uh, this vote is a little bit more split this time. I've got about 30% of you have voted so far. It's going well. And nearly half of you. Anyone else wants to vote? I leave it going for another minute or so. <clears throat> I'm just going to move my computer because my back hurts. There we go. Right. All good. We've got even more people have voted this time. Excellent. Two thirds of you have voted. I'm going to give it another couple of seconds because it looks like lots of people are going to vote. And it looks like most people are getting that correct as well. Absolutely fantastic. OK, so all 70 percent. Much better. Right. Yep. I'm going to end that. Anyone wants to vote? There we go. So the right answer was they're faster. OK, they are faster. So there's no time delay involved. Fantastic. Right. So when you get set this by your teacher, there are some exam questions and some mark schemes to have a look at. OK, so here this is asking you again to use that equation that was back uh, before. Now, that equation was given to you on these slides as a triangle, and you might want to use the triangle to help you do the calculation in number two. For these ones, it's to see if you can put them in the right order of wavelength. Now, you don't really need to memorize the wavelengths of any of these things. You just have to know what order they're in, because that's the biggest. And then we've got the next biggest, the next and the next. Because see, these are minus numbers. As the minus numbers get bigger, these numbers get smaller. So you need to see if you can put them in the right order. So try it before you look at the answer and then go back and see if you were right. Because before you do it, you might have made a flashcard about the sizes and tried to remember the order. And if you can remember the order, you should be able to do this question. Okay, so I'm gonna flip really quickly through the answers so that you don't see them. And then we've got the same, the same thing here. So this is just asking you, as long as you've got a scientific calculator and you can put that number in, it doesn't matter that that number looks big and difficult. As long as you can put the number in and you've got that triangle and you put it in correctly, you should be able to work out the correct thing. Now, remember, when we're using a triangle, what we do is we cover the thing that we want and we do what is left. So if you put your hand over wavelength, because that's what you want, it will then tell you what you have to do with frequency and wave speed. And remember, we know the wave speed of electromagnetic waves. It's always the same, always, always the same. And it was 300 million meters per second. And that was on one of these slides. You don't have to remember the number. It's on one of the slides. And that will allow you to calculate this. OK, they then get a little bit more difficult. And I would imagine only a few people could actually get to the bottom of those questions there. OK, now, now we're going the other way along the other side. OK, so before I was going to the left and I was talking about infrared and microwaves and radio waves. And now I'm going the other way and I'm talking about ultraviolet, X-rays and gamma rays. And remember, I said these ones were more dangerous. And we'll talk about why in a second. OK, so they're getting smaller now. Um, ultraviolet light discos. Now, there's a word people don't use anymore, but it's often used in nightclubs because ultraviolet light makes uh, white T-shirts, people's teeth and ultra and uh, fluorescent thing glow. They're what used on tanning beds and also in detecting uh, counterfeit notes. So when you give someone a 50 pound note and they put it under a blue light, that decides whether it's got, uh, you can see whether it's got a watermark or not. And bees actually can see um, using ultraviolet and it makes flowers 
glow for them so that they can see where they're going for pollination. Okay, so there's a watermark showing up uh, and some of those things. X-rays, again, we know what X-rays are, are used for. So if you go to the airport, they use it to see inside people's bags and we use it to see inside people. Problem is, too many X-rays can actually be dangerous, which is why they limit how many X-rays you have and why they certainly don't ask you to go through the X-ray machine in an airport. And we'll talk about why again, but that word that I used, ionizing, is what comes up here. And then gamma rays, these are the smallest. These are used for um, the, the thing that I think is the best example for you to remember is cancer treatment. So radiotherapy will use gamma rays that are targeted at tumors to kill them because they're actually quite dangerous. They destroy cells. And if we target them at tumor cells, we can destroy the tumor cells and reduce the size of a cancer uh, a tumor. Um, and that's what radiotherapy is. People have often heard of that. Again, seems a little bit odd, but too many of them can be a problem, okay? So too many of them can be a problem. And we're gonna get back to that. So dangers of the electromagnetic spectrum. Here is another bit that would make a good flashcard because what we're gonna talk about is as the frequency increases, the wavelength gets smaller. And so from this side down, they become ionizing. It's ionizing radiation, okay? So ionizing radiation is the problem there, okay? And if I can just add that in, non-ionizing, so these are the ones that are less likely to damage DNA and so cause cancer. So these don't ionize and cause cancer. So we've got infrared, microwave, and remember that includes um, mobile phone masts as well. So I'm just going to say that. So 4G and 5G are over here um, and radio waves. And we've got ionizing radiation that can be a problem. We all know ultraviolet tanning beds and too much sun can cause skin cancer, too many x-rays and gamma rays up there. So they can be quite dangerous. So let's try another little poll. Let's see how we were going there with those ones. Okay, so ionizing radiation. Why is ionizing radiation a problem? There's a quick question to see. So what is it that it can do? Okay, now I said why it does it. So it, it damages DNA, but that's, that's actually where that then leads to. So we get mutations. I'm only going to be about another minute or two. This webinar is nearly finished. So I've shown you everything um, that your teachers are going to set you. Just going to let slightly less people voting this time. Does that mean people are unsure? If you're unsure, maybe pop something in the Q and A box now. Or is that just because you you've not voted? Oh no, yes, we're up to nearly seventy percent again. Excellent. And again, nearly everybody getting it right. Absolutely fantastic. I'm just going to leave it another. I said I'd leave it up for a minute. So we've got another ten seconds or so if you want to have a vote. Brilliant. I'm going to end that. Oh, no, 72%. Fantastic. That's the most votes we've had so far. Excellent. And the right answer was it can cause cancer. Ionizing radiation, which is the ones on this side over here on the right hand side. So things that are really important when you go through these slides, try the exam questions. That's really useful and helpful. Put add another slide in, put your answer on, share it with your teacher. Make some flashcards. Make a flashcard of that equation, make a flashcard of the size of the electromagnetic spectrum and the speed of the waves. Make a flashcard of transverse and longitudinal. See if you can remember those things and then use them to answer the questions. This is a good question that allows you to see what you can remember about some of these waves down here. There are lots and lots of words on these about medical um, scans and how they work. If you're interested in this, have a good look through these, okay? But they are a bit wordy, but I wanted to explain. So this explains how some of these medical scans work and how x-rays work and explains why some of them are a little bit dangerous, okay? But these questions are worth knowing. So if you have a little look at those, you should be able to find the answer to these three things. So I'm not asking you to read the whole thing in, in detail, but perhaps just find the answer to those things because those are quite important facts about x-rays. And it compares a CT scanner 
that's the one that made these images and x-rays and perhaps having an idea about the difference between the two of those things. And then there are some more questions at the end about medical use of x-rays, okay, because that is something that it is worth knowing. So hopefully what you're able to do, and then there are some more questions with the answers afterwards as well, so you can test yourself. So hopefully what you're able to do from this now is know the difference between transverse and longitudinal and explain it. Be able to put the waves in order of size and know some of the uses of each of those waves in the electromagnetic spectrum. And the more complicated end, if you're aiming for level four and above, be able to use the wave equation to calculate the speed or perhaps use the triangle to be able to calculate wavelength or frequency and perhaps be able to explain the uses and dangers of x-rays. Okay, so that's the end of this webinar. So this, these slides will now be posted today by your teachers in your Google Classroom. Your week's work is to go through and do as many of the questions as you are able. If you are aiming for the higher end of foundation, you really need to make some flashcards about waves, the wave equation, and the electromagnetic spectrum. You can then put your answers on these slides and share them with your teachers. And I will do another webinar to explain the next piece of work at exactly this time next week. So what I'm gonna do is just hang around for a moment if anyone has got any other uh, questions at all for myself or Mr. Timmins. I am just gonna stop uh, sharing my screen there. So we go back to normal and also I'm gonna stop